Hello, Porto. How are you? For some reason, and I will never understand this, they like to give me the slot immediately after the party the night before. So, uh, good morning. I hope you're all doing okay out there, and uh, welcome to Fractals, Factories, and Fast Food. So, uh, this is a talk about all kinds of things. It's also, I've been told, it is the most appropriate use of the poop emoji that has ever been seen in a conference talk. So look out for that. Uh, this is me, Dylan Beatty. I do interesting things with computers and code and software. I run Ursatile, uh, which is a company I started in 2020 to do lots of speaker travel and training. Worst business plan ever. So that's finally actually sort of kicking off and doing its thing. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I run the London.NET user group in uh, London, where I'm from. And uh, I also once uh, invented a programming language as a joke in a bar that got implemented by people on the internet, and now it's a real programming language. So if any of you has ever been on LinkedIn and you want to apply for all those sweet Rockstar programmer jobs they advertise, you can learn Rockstar at codewithrockstar.com. And uh, the fun thing about Rockstar is that all your programs are also heavy metal songs. So even if your code doesn't work, you can still sing it. So it's got a nice bit of redundancy built into it that way. And uh, today, we are going to talk about networks. Now, networks are absolutely everywhere. Networks are how we move value and stuff and information and uh, fuel and energy from one place to another. And uh, you know, we have, you look at the world around us, there are transportation networks, there's road networks, telecoms networks, but then there are networks of data. There are networks of information. There are networks within our bodies. There are about five different systems in the human body, all of which can be treated and modeled and analyzed as a network in some sense. Now, uh, this talk started out as, can we tell the story of a slice of pizza? When you go on your phone and you, you order some food and it comes to the door, what actually needed to happen to make that possible? Like, how much stuff did we have to evolve and invent for that to be a thing that we can do? Now, I love pizza. I love food. I love, uh, I've only had one Francesinia so far this week, but I'm sure I can get in two and maybe a third before I go home tomorrow. Um, you know, I absolutely, I love food and I love convenience and I hate making phone calls. So the idea that you can push a button on your screen and somebody brings pizza to your house, like that is just one of the best things that human beings have ever invented. And the key thing in that observation is that they bring it here. They bring it to your house. All of the convenience, you know, Amazon and DoorDash and uh, Deliveroo and Just Eat and Takeaway.com, all these kinds of things, they have this sort of definition of convenience, which is we'll bring it to your door. You know, they won't bring it upstairs. I mean, maybe that's the future. You're like, I can't even bother to get out of bed today, but I still want pizza. And they'll actually let themselves in and come on up. But, you know, this is this kind of definition, this threshold of it gets to your door, and that's what we understand convenience to be. Now. We're going to talk a lot about networks, and in uh, software and mathematics, networks are very tightly coupled to the idea of something called a graph. Now, we don't have enough words in English for all the crazy stuff that computer people keep coming up with, because, you know, you talk about graphs, there are different kinds of graphs. You get graphs you get in maths, and you get graphs you see on the news, and you get these kinds of graphs, because in mathematics, a graph is a collection of things and relationships between the things. That, fundamentally, is all that a graph is. So, what we are gonna do now, we're talking about this is sort of graph theory definition. It has nothing to do with GraphQL. I told you there were too many words. Um, and we are gonna take a moment and we are gonna look at how we can model some of these ideas about networks and convenience. Now, uh, my house at home, where I spent most of the last two years, I have a room upstairs, which is my office. And my office is connected to the landing. And then the landing in my house, that is connected to a bunch of other rooms. There's a bathroom, there's a bedroom, I can get to the stairs, and the stairs get me to the hallway, and the hallway gets me to the kitchen, the living room, and outside. And then outside gets me to Pizza Roma, which is the place around the corner that does the really good pizza, and outside gets me to the Sydney Opera House, and outside gets me to the Empire State Building. And you're sort of looking at this and going, well, yeah, but that doesn't really help. Um, and the reason is we haven't defined the nature of these relationships. We haven't actually said, no, no, we're modeling one particular kind of relationship between these objects. So we need to add a legend to this diagram. So there it is. The legend is the, the orange things, rooms in my house, and the lines are places I can walk to in bare feet. 
like places I don't need to put shoes on. Because really, that's convenience, isn't it? Like if you've got to put shoes on, uh, no, too much effort. If you can do it without shoes, that's convenient. That's why we bring things to the door. And so now we can update our graph and we can take these things out. And we have introduced a boundary here. The things inside the blue, they're convenient. And the things outside the blue, they are inconvenient. And so we've used this idea of graph theory to introduce this threshold of convenience, which gives us a way of kind of talking about, well, what do we need to solve here? What are the problems that we're interested in? Now, we're going to backtrack a little bit. We're going to go back in time to about 1999, because in 1999, I was in my second year of studying computer science here. This is the University of Southampton on the south coast of England, where I, I had a lot of fun, and I, I learned a lot of stuff about Linux that I've never used in my day job. And uh, in my final year, I lived here. Specifically, I lived here. And the computer science department was here. It was very, very close. It was about, I think, about 300 meters, that distance to walk it. Now, the internet existed in 1999. You know, we had it. And we had email, and we had the web, and we were just kind of figuring out, hey, maybe we could do stuff with the internet which isn't just text. Now, you know, we didn't really have broadband and stuff, but we had this. We had Backstreet Boys, and we had Shania Twain, and we had Will Smith doing the Willennium, and we had S Club Party, and uh, we had Napster file sharing. And this was a big deal, because suddenly there was all this music on the internet that you could get even if you hadn't paid for it, which was awesome if you were a student with no money who liked music. Now, the interesting thing, we had internet at home, but it was dial-up. It was 56 kilobit dial-up shared between me and the three other people who lived in my house. And so I actually calculated the threshold because the computer science department here, they had a T1 connection. That was a 1.5 megabit internet, you know, and that was a big deal. And I worked out that uh, I could walk to the department, I could download stuff onto my iOmega zip disk, and I could walk back. And the latency of that journey, that was a four megabyte round trip. Any file bigger than four megabytes, it was quicker to put shoes on, walk around the corner, download the file, put it on the zip disk, walk back again and take the shoes off again than it was to just sit at home and wait for it. Four megabytes, that was the threshold. Now, most pop songs, you know, MP3 is about a megabyte a minute. Most pop songs were like, you know, three, four minutes because that's what plays well on the radio. So if I wanted to download any prog rock where all the songs are like six, seven, eight minutes, I was putting shoes on that day, you know? Now, at some point, they had a problem with the security on the back door of that building, and we had to go the long way around. And that detour increased it to an eight megabyte round trip. And so suddenly it was like, well, I guess I'm downloading the new Porcupine Tree album here because I don't want to walk all the long way around. <coughs> now that T1 connection there, um, this was kind of the catchment area. Because, you know, this was the days when, like I said, people were starting to get dial-up internet at home so you could do your emails and, you know, browse the, the web as it existed. Now, you got to remember, this is before we invented JavaScript frameworks and stuff. So the web was a very, very different place. But that connection there, that, that circle, that served about 1,000 people. I reckon about 1,000 people probably got their internet from the T1 connection in the computer science building. But to do that, they had to go there. They had to get up, put shoes on, leave the house, get on there, and then they could use this, this glorious bandwidth and uh, download all the stuff that they wanted. And then a couple of years later, about 2001, we got this. Did anyone recognize one of these? These were like the biggest thing in the world for about 18 months, and then they just vanished. This was the first generation of ADSL modems that were rolled out in the, in the UK, I think in a couple of other places in Europe as well. And uh, this thing would give you 576K of bandwidth. That's nearly half a megabit, right? Now, the amazing thing about these modems is uh, the cable that runs into my house looks like this. And it's probably been there. There are places in the UK where this cable was put in in the 1960s, and it's still there. And you've got two pairs of wires, and one pair of wires there is actually used for voltage. You know, if uh, any of you still has a landline telephone at home, um, that thing doesn't use the mains electricity. 
The telephone network has its own power grid so that your phone will still ring even if the power is out. So one pair of these wires here, the orange pair, they carry 50 volts of DC current. So don't strip that wire with your teeth or uh, it's very, very tingly, I can tell you that. But the other pair, we have one pair of cables. And the challenge was, can we use that one pair of cables to get broadband into people's houses? Now, if you look at the way a phone network works, you go out in the street and you'll see these little metal boxes. Sometimes they'll be up on a pole, sometimes they're on the street, sometimes they're underground. But each one of these serves about 100 different residences and businesses. And then, you know, you take these and then these are all connected together to an upstream phone exchange. And then the upstream phone exchanges, those are all connected connected together to central exchanges and eventually you get to the point where you have one of these in Portugal, it's connected to the one across the border in Spain and then the one in Spain connects to Paris and Paris connects to London and that's how we get originally phone calls from you know where I live to where you live. And uh, so the question is, on the one hand, this stuff sucks. The telephone network is two wires that have been there since the 1960s. On the other hand, it's there. It exists. This technology is already installed. So when they started rolling out broadband, what they did was they rolled out the high bandwidth fiber connections into the green box on the corner because they'd worked out they could get about probably about eight megabits was the limit at the time. Now the limit there, the challenge, the reason why domestic broadband has got faster and faster and faster, they haven't upgraded the cables. They've upgraded the backbone network that gets the signal as far as the green metal box on the corner. But fundamentally, what has got better is the quality of the equipment that we use in our homes to get onto that broadband network. Now, there is fiber broadband. I got very excited when I saw this on the thing around the corner of my house. I'm like, look, they got fiber here. That doesn't mean that the fiber is actually going to run all the way to my house. What they've done is they've run fiber from the internet backbone as far as that cabinet. And then there's about two kilometers of copper. Now, in the 2001, when I first got broadband, that little blue fish modem thing, that wasn't terribly powerful because computers were not as powerful as they are today. It was expensive, and they could get 576 kilobits up to about 2Ks. If you lived more than 2Ks away from your phone exchange, you didn't get to play broadband. That wasn't a thing that we did. But we've got better and better at building systems that can get more and more bandwidth out of the same cable. If you go online now, um, this is the, uh, the, the Asus... RTAX82U, and you know, it looks like a kind of futuristic space hovercraft or something, because that's how you sell hardware to gamers. And this thing has got a 1.5 gig triple core processor, 256 megs of RAM, 512 megabytes of, uh, sorry, flash storage, and 512 megs of RAM, and it costs about 200 euros. You know, this is like a hundred times more powerful than the computer that I had to download Backstreet Boys onto. And this is just a modem. You know, but because it can do that, it can do all sorts of incredibly sophisticated error correction. It can extract much more bandwidth from the noisy signal that you get over these uh, two kilometers of copper wire. And so that's how we get to the point where over the last couple of years, I've been doing online training. I've been doing talks like this live over the internet. My house in London, I have about 48 megabits of bandwidth, and it's still running over those two little copper wires that have been there since, uh, I think my house 1981 is when it was built. So that's when the, the cable was put in. And as far as I know, no one's ever upgraded it. But that just works, not because we made the network any better, but because we have invested all of this in making tech technology that can get more signal out of the same cable because the alternative is we need to run better cable everywhere. And that's not just a question of previously you'd run one cable, now you need to run a hundred. Some of those cables are going to have to go into listed buildings where you're not allowed to just turn up and drill holes in the wall. Some of them are going to go to apartment buildings where it's like, you got someone up on the 27th floor, do we have a ladder that big? No, we don't. So that last mile challenge, or the, I guess the last kilometer challenge if you're in the, the rest of the world, that is a real headache when it comes to rolling out any kind of network infrastructure. Because it's really easy to get something to a point where if people are going to put on shoes and walk five minutes around the corner, there's one in the neighborhood. But actually getting it into people's homes, that is a big deal. Now, in my uh, router at home, as well as the uh, you know, incredibly clever signal processing that talks to the old telephone network, I have a SIM card. Um, actually, anyone here got 5G on their phones? Because uh, I have 5G at home, but it doesn't work because there's no 5G coverage. But I have 4G, 
which means I can get good enough broadband, good enough bandwidth to actually do live Zoom talks and stuff. Um, at one point, I unplugged the network cable from my modem uh, just to check that the failover worked. And then the doorbell went, and I went to get my package, and I forgot about it. And I forgot about it for two days. And I didn't realize my whole house was running over a 4G SIM card for two days until I went to log into Azure, and it said, your IP address is not on the, the list here. And I'm like, is it? Is I'm, oh, oh. And I was like, wow, I did an entire conference yesterday on a SIM card. And it just worked. You know, this is some pretty amazing technology. And this is how we do Netflix and Amazon Prime and, you know, Spotify and Zoom calls and online gaming and all that kind of stuff. And it's how we can order pizza. So we're going to go now. We're going to build up the pizza from the ground up. We're going to look at the networks that are involved in making the pizza happen. So we got the networks we can use to order the pizza. Now we need the networks that we use to make a pizza. Now pizza, we're going to start at the bottom. Pizza base made from bread dough. Most bread dough, most flour in the world comes from Canada. Canada is one of the world's biggest exporters of uh, flour and uh, you know grain and that kind of stuff. Now. You probably have a picture in your head. When I say, you know, imagine a farmer, you're probably thinking, you know, a guy with a big straw hat, maybe a little piece of straw like we had in the kids' picture books. Eh, farming doesn't work like that anymore. Um, for a long time, for most of human history, one person working seven days a week, 10 hours a day, could produce enough food to feed 1.5 people. So if everyone in your family was healthy and all of you were working on the farm or you were you know, hunting or you were gathering, you had enough food that you, know, you could look after grandma who's getting a bit old and she can't work the field anymore. You've got enough to feed your kids. Maybe you've got enough to get you through the winter and you know, keep some saved up in case somebody gets injured. And there are parts of the world where life is still like that, where if your family wants to eat, all of you are working on gathering food all day, every single day of your adult lives. But industrialization, the Industrial Revolution, we started kind of moving those numbers. Um, by the 1950s, we had mechanization, we had mechanical tractors. One farmer could uh, feed about 20 people. So suddenly the other 19 people are like, I can start doing other stuff. I can go and study mathematics. I can invent computers. I can invent JavaScript frameworks, you know, all these kinds of things. Today, we're at the point where one farmer, you know, big industrialized farming like this, each farmer produces enough food for about 500 people. Now, on the one hand, that's pretty amazing because now all the other, those 499 other people who don't have to farm, they can go and do all kinds of other things with their lives and they can make art and music and invent broadband routers and all this kind of stuff. But modern farming is seriously high tech. Like take all of the amazing stuff with autonomous vehicles and mesh sensor networks, the stuff you're not allowed to do in the street because that's the public street and you might hurt somebody. Farms are private land. Farms are these huge swathes of land that are owned by someone and are not available to the public. And they're like, we will do literally anything here that will give us a competitive edge when it comes to guaranteeing the output from, you know, farming's expensive. You pour a huge amount of money into the land and the equipment. You want to get as much out of that as you can. So <clears throat> they have networks where there will literally be, you know, satellites, thermal imaging combined with infrared cameras on drones that will go and go that bit, that corner of that field, that looks a little warmer than it should be. We need a tiny bit more water there. That bit, that's a little bit cooler than it should be. We're probably watering that bit too much. And they will feed this into a sensor network. Uh, there are GPS-based planting systems now that plant sugar beet. You know sugar beet starts at tiny seed ends up, I think about this big. And then when they go and plow the field, they can put the plow blade within a centimeter of the crop each side without damaging the actual beet itself. And so it gets you know, earth around it with nutrients and everything. And all of this is because we have these kinds of precision networks. Now, there's a, there's a thing called DOT. And this is DOT. DOT is basically a massive diesel-powered radio-controlled car that you can put accessories onto. Like, you know when you're a kid and you go to the toy store and you can get like the toy which has all the different interchangeable parts? This is DOT, but it's doing that on a farming scale. It has uh, equipment for doing crop seeding. It has equipment for doing irrigation. It has equipment for doing harvesting. And these things are real. You know, it's got an eight and a half liter diesel engine. So it's a huge truck. And they just drive around the farms all day, every day, you know, planting stuff, harvesting stuff, driven by mesh sensor networks. And uh, little snippets, I think most of the, like, 
autonomy, uh, automation for that thing is done using Python at the moment. So this is the world we actually live in. We have these huge farms. They turn out a couple of thousand tons of wheat every year. All that wheat gets, uh, some of it is processed on site. So the crop is processed, turned into flour. Some of it they'll just export somewhere else. And it ends up on one of these. It ends up on a container ship. Um, you'll remember last year the Ever Given got wedged sideways in the Suez Canal and there was like a traffic jam. But there was like a traffic jam of container ships that couldn't get from, uh, you know, China, Taiwan, Singapore, couldn't get to Europe through the Suez Canal. And my brother ordered a graphics card and it took six months to arrive because of that traffic jam. It's like my graphics card is still stuck somewhere off the coast of Egypt and maybe they think it might get through next month. Now, <coughs> international shipping, these things, containers, if you can get your stuff into one of these, it can go just about anywhere in the world. This is like the TCP IP packets of physical stuff. We have this transportation network that's like, we don't care what's in the container. We got a machine that'll take the container, load it up, put it on the truck. Then we got a machine that'll take it off the truck, put it on the ship. We got a machine that takes it off the ship, puts it on the train. We got a machine at the other end that'll take it off the train, put it on the truck. It'll rock up outside your house. And it's your problem again, you know, going, if any of you's ever like moved house across continents, like you've moved from one continent to another, at some point you probably got one of these with all your stuff in it, because at that point they're just shipping packets, big metal packets. This is the standard unit. And again, you know, truck driving is absolutely vital. The road transportation network is, we rely on it. All this stuff, you know, pizza and graphics cards, all these kinds of things. And that's somewhere where there's an awful lot of disruption going on. I want to show you this. This is Vera. And uh, Vera looks like something out of science fiction. Vera looks like something out of Blade Runner. Um, Vera is an autonomous truck. And Vera is real. Vera is working right now. It's a collaboration between Volvo and a Scandinavian shipping company called DFDS Seaways. And this vehicle is taking containers between the DFDS freight depot and the cargo port in Gothenburg. And part of that journey involves driving on a public highway. So we, right now, we have these autonomous vehicles that are taking shipping containers out of a port, driving them along the road, and taking them to where they can be loaded onto trucks. Now, on the one hand, we need this. You know, human beings, there are more people than ever before, and our appetite for stuff is just going up and up and up. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Brexit and all the joys we have going on with that. Apparently right now there is a 27-hour tailback to get trucks through the port of Dover in the UK to process all the paperwork. Um, and the news isn't talking about it, but if you read any blogs from Polish truck drivers, they're not very happy about this. So we need the infrastructure. You know, we need the capacity. We need more stuff. But this is also going to be a massive social disruptor. There's something like three and a half million people in the United States right now who drive a truck. That's their living. That's how they make their money and feed their kids and everything. And uh, if you drive a truck, the law says that you can work a max, I think it's 10 hours in the US, and then you have to have a 10 hour break. So these huge trucks spend half their time parked while the driver is resting or sleeping. We roll out autonomous trucks that are like, nope, we're electric, we run silently, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three and a half million Americans suddenly out of work. You know, what politician is gonna run for office on that ticket? because it's not going to happen anytime soon, but we don't have enough truck drivers to go around. The ones that we do have, they're incredibly politically important, because if they don't vote for you, you're not going to win, but it's still not enough to go around. So this is the network that gets our pizza to us. The flour comes from Canada. The, uh, if you have mozzarella, you know where most mozzarella in Europe comes from? Denmark. Denmark is the biggest exporter of mozzarella. Uh, pineapples here, probably from Costa Rica. Uh, tomatoes that go on, these are probably from, uh, actually Portugal is one of the big exporters of tomatoes. The Netherlands is another one. If you've got shrimp or seafood on your pizza, that almost certainly went through Indonesia. So we have this massive global distribution network of stuff coming in from all over the world and it ends up here and that is just one of the networks that goes in here. We've got the power network because you can't really cook pizza without lights to see what you're doing, so they need power. We have the gas network, because pizza ovens, electric doesn't really cut it. You need burning gas to get up to the right temperature, or you need trucks full of charcoal if you're doing it, you know, charcoal ovens. Um, you need data, you need the banking network. 
when you pay for your pizza, a little bit of that money goes to the, well, all of it goes to the pizza company, and then some of that goes to the takeaway company, but the pizza company use it to pay the flour company, and the flour company use it to pay the trucking company, and the trucking company use it to pay the shipping company. So when you order pizza online, a couple of cents of that is going to the people who own these massive container ships that they're bringing all over the world. So we have this fantastic coordinated system of all of these different networks all converging, and they make your extra large stuffed crust pepperoni with extra mozzarella cheese and pineapple, and it ends up here, on the back of a bike with a guy going up and down your road because he can't find your address. And you're looking out the window going, is that my pizza? Is that, that must, be, yeah, he looks lost. Eventually you go and you're like, hey, pizza? And he goes, no, no, oh, oh okay, sorry. Um, this is one of the big problems. And uh, the difficulty with, we talked about, you know, the last mile or last kilometer infrastructure with installing networks, installing fiber optic cable and stuff. But at least that they've only got to do it once. Like if the engineer is coming to install your fiber, you're probably going to try and make sure they know where you live. With stuff happens every day, you know, deliveries and the mail and pizza showing up. We have a problem in that addresses are complicated. Now, uh, Joel Spolsky has this thing, Spolsky's Law of Leaky Abstractions. All non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. Now, we have this idea that you can write down somebody's address, and uh, then you can find their house. Now, uh, imagine this is a map of my house. This is not a map of my house, because my house is in a weird place, and I don't want to put a map of where I live on the internet in case I upset anybody who invests in crypto, because those people look dangerous to me. But my house is in the wrong place. My house is on a street that's about three kilometers long, it's right in the middle, and it's number seven. So if you start at this end, we are like, what? That's number 200, that's number 400, number seven is in the middle, the area I live was uh, basically bombed during World War II, and then when they rebuilt it, they just made up the street numbers as they went along. So we have this uh, convention in most parts of uh, you know, Europe and the West that uh, we have a street, and the first house on the street is number one, and number two is opposite number one, and then there's number three, and number four, five, six, all the way along the street. So you need to find number one, I'd say it's probably at this end. Start there, work your way along. If you need to find number 15, it'll be between number 13 and number 17. Uh, actually, I, I noticed last night, we got back to the hotel after the dinner, um, and uh, Rob Richardson was like, you know the way the hotel room numbers, like you're in 14, and there's 16, but over there, that's 12 and that's 15? I'm like, he's like, there's no 13. No room 13 in the hotel, because it's unlucky. So they've messed up the numbering system just in one corridor of one hotel. Now, you'd think that maybe there's some things we can rely on when it comes to addressing. Like, uh, you know, if you know which city you're going for and uh, you know the name of the street, right? Well, no. There are 15 streets in London called High Street. So if you write number one High Street London, there are 15 different places that are like, yeah, that's me, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you won't get negative house numbers, right? Like, you've got to start at one and work your way up. Well, yeah, mostly. This is a cocktail bar. Again, it's in, in London, quite near where I live, and uh, this used to be a public toilet, so it didn't have an address, because why would a toilet have an address? And the building next to it is number one Aldwych. That's the Lyceum Theatre, where they've been showing The Lion King forever. So when they turned this toilet into a bar, they're like, we need an address. And they're like, well, that's one, that's two, that's three. I guess we're zero. But you can't put zero as a number, so the name of this building is zero, Z-E-R-O, Aldwych. And that's the thing that they have to put in the addresses, because no database in the world will allow you to put zero Aldwych. And uh, in a town called Newbury, which is just outside London, there is a minus one Priory Road, because they already had zero, and they built another house next to it. And again, the name of the house is minus one, Priory Road. That's the name of the place. And uh, yeah, so these are the kind of abstractions that we are, we're trying to deal with when we address stuff. Now, it probably seems obvious to us that, of course, you, 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 know, you build the street, and then you give all the buildings addresses, and the streets are the things which have names. In Japan, they use a completely different system. If you want to go here, this is uh, 257 Maranucci. What you do is you get a Maranucci. And uh, you probably, in the days before Google Maps, what you do is you'd find a policeman and you'd say, hey, where is building number two? Now, building number two would be the second building that got built in Maranucci, or the second block. 
So the first city block that got built there, that would be block one. The second block would be block two. It might be on the other side of the district. It might be right next door. The third block is block number three. Then you go to somebody who knows the way around block number two, and you say, hey, uh, which one of these buildings was built fifth? Because the first building to go up, that would be 2-1 Marinucci. The second building would be 2-2 Marinucci. So you're like, that one, that one, that one. Okay, that one, that one was built fifth. So you got to number fifth, you knock on the door, you're like, hello, uh, which business moved in here seventh, please? Because the whole addressing system is assigned chronologically. Numbers are given out as they are needed. So the first block is one, the second block is two, the first building is one, the second building is two. The first inhabitant, first people to move in, they get number one. The streets don't have names. Why would you name the street? The street is the gap between the important parts, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You give the names and numbers to the bits that people care about. And of course, that system seems completely obvious until somebody who has grown up with the Western addressing system is lost in Tokyo going, I don't know where I am and none of these streets have names. But you know, you flip it around and somebody who has grown up with this system visits London or Paris and they're like, how do you live here? None of the blocks have names. Like, why did you name the gaps? So we have these two completely counterintuitive systems. And so, you know, nerds like us are like, you know what we need here? We need synthetic keys. Relying on natural data is not good enough. Let's invent the postal code. And you'd think we couldn't really screw that up, right? Like, how hard can it be? It's the postal code. It's designed so you can deliver post. So you have a code, and that should tell the, the post person where to take the post. Now, on the one hand, this is one building in Wales. This is the building where the UK government runs all of its driver and vehicle licensing, so your driver's license, registration form for your car. Um, they have 11 postcodes that go to the same building because one of them is for vehicle registration, one is for driver licenses, one of them is for a personalized license plate. So these all go physically to the same place, but they got 11 different postcodes. Then if you go over here to uh, the University of Warwick, there are something like, I think there's about 1,500 different addresses that have the same postal code because they assigned this code to all of the student residences. So there's about, no, it's 1,500 people. There are 1,500 people and offices and, uh, you know, professors and things all living in this one area and all of them share the same postcode. So postcodes, nice idea didn't work. We managed to mess that one up because, you know, it looked like it, it was going to work and then we just didn't quite get it right. So let's go further. Well, like, it's okay. We don't actually need codes anymore. We know where we are. We have GPS. We all have a little thing in our pocket that is literally talking to outer space 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can use GPS to find out where we are. And so you ping one of your friends. You're like, hey, yeah, coffee would be great. Meet me at 50.447293232 north, 30.52, yada, 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 west in half an hour. And if you do this to normal people, they go, what? Because, you know, GPS coordinates, to get down to a level where you can actually meet someone for coffee, you need a huge amount of precision. Just, you know, if you take off the decimal point, you're talking about a one square nautical mile of a longitude and latitude, and that's a pretty big area, you know, it covers a good chunk of downtown Porto. Now. There are still companies coming up with some fairly innovative solutions to solve and address this kind of thing. One of them is a company called What Three Words. And What Three Words has divided planet Earth up into three by three meter squares, which is kind of small enough that unless you're at the front of like a Linkin Park concert, you can probably see whether your friend is here or not. And then they have given every single one of these squares a code. Now, this is kind of a fun idea, and I really like what they've done with it. It does have one tiny little pitfall that perhaps they did not anticipate, which is that words have meanings. So I went on last night, and I punched in the uh, Alfandega Conference Center, where we are now, and I was like, you know, that's a pretty big building. Now, do you want to go during a pandemic to a conference that is at mouth asking transmit? You know, you think that's a good one? No, no, okay, so let's have a look at another one. Trust wasps ever. That, by the way, that's pretty much exactly where I am stood right now, because that block is this building, and that's kind of the end of room one. Uh, do I trust wasps ever? No. I don't like wasps. Wasps are nasty, and they don't do anything useful. Misfits requested event. Did we? Did you? Did I? I mean, I couldn't wait for NDC to come back, and you know, maybe I'm one of the misfits who requested the event. Uh, so eventually I thought, you know what, if we're going to use the, the what three words here, 
Data Indeed Hobbies. I think that's a nice, yeah, you want to come to NDC, it's going to be here. Data Indeed Hobbies, because that's like a nice balance. So I think, you know, we can, we can pick a what three words for that. But we can only do that because we got a lot of space, so we got a lot of different grid squares in here to play with. So we have all these high-tech and low-tech solutions for how to locate a point in space where somebody might have ordered a pizza from. And uh, you're sat there, doorbell rings, you're like, ah, pizza. And at that point, a whole new set of networks kicks in. Now, uh, some of you might be familiar with a, a software architectural pattern called CQRS, the uh, Command Query Responsibility Separation or Segregation. Um, did you know the human body uses CQRS? We have two different nervous systems. We have the sensory uh, nervous system network, and we have the motor nervous system network. And the sensory one is the one that goes ding dong, ooh, I hear the doorbell, and I thought I heard a moped, and I can see there's someone outside, and I think I can smell grilled cheese. And so that is the, that's the query input. And then at that point, it issues a command via a separate network. It's like you need to get your ass up off the sofa and go and open the door because there is pizza here. We have these five sensory networks feeding data and input into the human body. And then, you know, when they get in there, your brain analyzes all this stuff and figures it out. Now, the sensory networks in the human body are astonishing. Um, our eyes, have you ever, like, taken your laptop outside on a sunny day? and you just can't read the screen because it's too bright. And you're like, but last night when I was inside with the lights out, my laptop was too bright, I had to turn it down. Um, our eyes can cope with an astonishing range of magnitude of brightness. Our ears can do the same thing. You know, we can hear someone like, you know, dropping a marble on the other side of a, a massive warehouse if there's no other noise in there, but we can also go down the front at a really loud rock concert and we can hear all the different notes and pick those out of the music. We can distinguish, scientists think it's something like a trillion different smells. Like uh, they've done analyses where they've taken like 128 different compounds and combined them and got a bunch of volunteers to go, yeah, I think I know what that one is. And this one is that one with a little bit of that added to it. And, you know, extrapolating from this data set. This was a Rockefeller University, 2014 was where they did the study. And they're like, yeah, we think it might be like a trillion. Like literally we can't do the experiment because people don't live long enough for us to test all the things we want to test on what one person can smell. And that is just one of these networks. So you go to the door and you get your pizza and you take a bite of it and, you know, your taste network gives you this, ah, oh, that's really good grilled cheese. And then the, uh, you know, the digestive network kicks in and it starts breaking down that pizza into nutrients and, you know, fat. There's some bits which you absorb immediately. Your body will digest the sugar out of that. Some of it your body will store for the winter because... Uh, Obviously, we can't get pizza in winter, so we need to put on a little bit of extra padding to get through the, the lean months there. Um, some of it ends up becoming waste, you know. Now, <clears throat> the circulatory system that takes the sugar and takes the, you know, the energy from that, that starts off with this thing here. This is your aorta. That's about this big. It's a blood vessel maybe three, four centimeters in diameter that's about this long. And then that just branches out and out and out, almost exactly like the broadband networks we talked about at the beginning. And then you get down to the capillaries and the tips of your fingers, that's the two kilometers of copper wire that you can't use it for anything major, but because the distance there is so short, it's just enough to get that energy to where it's needed and to, to bring the stuff back in the other direction. And we end up with waste. You know, there's a fair chunk. There's the box your pizza came in. You need to get rid of that somehow. There's also uh, the, uh, shall we say, the biological packaging that the pizza comes in. And, uh, well, put it this way. Would you rather live in a house where you could get pizza but you didn't have a toilet? Or would you rather live in a house where you had a toilet but you had to go around the corner to get pizza? Which one of those would you rather was round the corner and shared with the rest of the folks in your neighborhood? Because that's a relatively recent invention. Only within the last hundred years have we had plumbing and sewerage systems to dispose of all the bits of pizza that our body doesn't need. Now, we could go even further. We are still, this whole model is reliant on the idea that uh, all these ingredients have to be farmed and, you know, fished and cultivated and then physically assembled and put together. But really, what we're talking about here is molecules. We are just talking about stuff that your body enjoys eating and that gives you fuel. Could we get to the, uh, the whole idea of the Star Trek replicator, where you just have something in your house that is going to go in and say, yeah, I want a stuffed crust pizza. It's like, yep, all right, give me a, about a kilo of molecules, and it's just going to assemble that for you.
Um, now, one thing I never noticed in Star Trek, you notice how you never see anyone do the dishes. So they must have some kind of mechanism for putting the stuff back in to the replicators at the other side of it. And if any of you have read this book, uh, Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age, um, this is a fantastic book about neo-Victorian nanotechnology engineering. And uh, the network that exists in this book is a thing called the feed. And the feed is just molecules. The feed is a pipe running into everyone's house that gives them raw molecules that can be assembled into um, objects and tools and uh, toys and all this kind of stuff. And so they have mastered nanotech engineering to the extent where, now they don't eat it. That's one of the weird things about the Diamond Age is that uh, he didn't kind of take that extra step further. But, you know, it does start bringing up these questions about what does the future of food delivery look like? Now, this is a 3D printer that makes pizza, and this is real. They've seen this thing at trade shows, and you know, it has a, a couple of nozzles. If any of you've got a 3D printer at home, you know, you've got like different filament. Well, let's just imagine that the nozzle's really wide and the filament isn't filament, it's bread. And then you have another nozzle here which prints tomato, and another nozzle here which prints cheese. Um, this is the, the Coca-Cola freestyle vending machine where instead of like them having you know, a big tank of Coke and a big tank of, uh, what, what is Coke's uh, fruit thing, Sprite, and it's like, no, no, we've got like a thousand different flavors. And you can get an app for this. So you can walk into like a Burger King and you can download the app and you can be like, I want a 3% grape and 2% blueberry and 5% caffeine. And you put a button and it'll synthesize the soda that you just designed there. Um, and this thing here, the sugar bot, this is a smart bakery that uh, you use an app to talk to it, and it's like, yeah, what do you want? You want vegan donuts, you want regular chocolate donuts, and it just has all the ingredients, it synthesizes this in software. Now, these kind of things, they are at trade shows at the moment. There are very few people actually using anything like this to you know, make real food for real people to eat, but the concept has been proved. Now, uh, something that I'm confident of, we are gonna get you know, stuff that works on this basis. We are going to start seeing technology that delivers alternatives to the idea of having to farm things and cultivate them and prepare them and then deliver the finished prepared product. And I think they are going to be like electricity, like plumbing, like broadband. You are going to have one of these in your neighborhood a long time before you have one in your house. These will be something, uh, there's a vending machine in uh, Garden North Station in Paris now that bakes bread. And you go and you, you pay with your card and it literally bakes you a loaf of bread and it's open 24-7. And Paris is designed, uh, like completely divided as to whether a machine should be allowed to bake bread or not. But, you know, this is, we're starting to see the first uh, signs of this happening in, in everyday life. But fundamentally, when you have a slice of pizza, you are getting three things. First of all, you're getting fuel. Your body needs calories to live. Second, you are getting sensations. You know, pizza is nice, food is nice. It's part of a social rituals, but it's also a, an enjoyable experience. We've evolved to like food. That's why we keep eating it, because that way we don't die. And, uh, you know, as we've already seen, there is a, a certain amount of byproduct involved in this whole process that we also need to anticipate in the design of our networks. What if we could decouple these things? What if we could be like, well, actually, the byproduct, let's eliminate that completely. The fuel, well, you can get fuel out of anything your body can digest. Doesn't matter if it doesn't taste good. We could eat blue-green algae. We could eat insect protein. We could eat all kinds of things, which leaves the bit in the middle, which is the sensation, because, you know, we want food to be nice. We anticipate good meals. Now, the kid in this picture is uh, wearing a cochlear implant hearing aid. And the bit you can see there on the outside, that's not the clever bit. That's the battery and the transmitter. There is a tiny piece of circuitry implanted inside his ear, which is literally wiring a microphone directly into the nerves inside his ear. Um, did any see that movie, The Sound of Metal, with uh, Riz Ahmed a couple of years ago? So that uh, movie, the sound design for that won an Oscar. And that, the bit at the end where he turns his implants on, that shows you what, or like illustrates what that actually sounds like. So we are not at the point yet where we can make synthetic hearing that works as well as a normal human ear, but we are at the point where we are literally using sensors of, you know, artificial chips to put electricity into someone's brain and their brain is then figuring out how to turn that into sensory input that actually improves their quality of life. And you know, these are the early steps, but at this point it's just engineering. We validated the concept. We need, you know, better sensors. We need to understand better how the human brain responds to electricity. But potentially, you know, the future of takeaway food 
is you plug yourself into the matrix, you go on your Just Eat app, and you're like, download pizza, and then you just sit and you eat your 500 grams of locally sourced insect protein while your brain is going, ah, oh, pepperoni, this is so good, this is amazing. Because, you know, maybe this is the future. Maybe we decouple the uh, taste sensations, which mean we need all of these massive multinational networks from the fact that we just need food to live. We synthesize the whole thing, and you order pizza directly to your brain. But as we've already seen, it's difficult enough delivering to street addresses. You send a stuffed crust pepperoni pizza and accidentally goes to the neighbor's IP address, they are probably going to find themselves in for one hell of a shock. Thank you, folks. I think we, we have time for questions, if there are questions. Or is this everyone going, I'm just going to go and get pizza now. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the conference. We're going to be doing some fun stuff in the Expo Hall this evening, so stick around for the party. Uh, we're going to be doing some music. Lemon is running an improvised like comedy talks thing, which sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Go and get uh, front of the coffee queue, and I'll see you all around. Take it easy.